Welcome ladies and gents, Chris Andre here, you can find me at Bet Boxing on Twitter or of course you can subscribe to the channel, let's talk boxing, let's talk about the DAZN card tonight, we'll start off with the main event and that was Dalton Smith against Sam O'Mason, long time subscribers will know I'm massive on Dalton Smith, I have been for a very long time, same with his father and trainer Grant Smith who I think is a brilliant trainer, you know, Sheffield is rightly renowned for being associated with the Winkerbank Gym, the Ingle Gym, because it's churned out so many superb fighters, world champions, brilliant fighters, Prince Nassim Hamid, Kel Brook, Johnny Nelson, Ryan Rhodes, the list is endless of the fighters that have been produced from there. But Sheffield is a hub for British boxing, not just in the Winkerbank Gym, but clearly beyond that gym, because Grant Smith is terrific and he's produced a brilliant uh, fighter in his son, Sonny Edwards, we know, goes up there now and he's one of the best uh, talents in the in the sport, let alone in British boxing, he's, he's you know establishing himself as a, a superb world champion. So, you know Sheffield as a whole is a real hub to Steel City for British boxing, and it continues to to churn out talent after talent. And you could quite clearly see today in a British title fight, he was way above British level. This was a complete mismatch, and it was just one of those things whereby. He was quite cagey early on. They were both cagey. I've got an itchy nose. I don't know what's going on here, right? So I'm not picking my nose. Don't worry. It's the bridge of the nose. <laughs> it was cagey early on. And he was engaging the lead hand of O'Mason. And they were almost both willing to do this. So he would just pour it out and just touch the lead hand of O'Mason. They weren't really throwing any jabs. But by doing that, he's ensuring that he always knew where the trajectory of the shot was. He was always very careful to engage it, to make sure he knew where he was positionally. His hand positioning was also very good as well as his distance control and then from there he'll start to bring the backhand into play when he eases his way into range and he'll throw that backhand in a varied manner sometimes it will be straight down the pipe like an arrow other times he's looping a wide right hand from range and he had a lot of success doing that from range even when he started to see that he was finding a lot of success looping that right hand wide he started to vary the way he was setting it up so he'd start to give different looks for instance sometimes he would step in and throw it other times, when, for instance, the stoppage shot, the final shot, he ducked as though he was going to come low. And he used the misdirection as though he was going to shoot the shot down. And then he came around over the top. So he's very smart. He's a chess player. Now, I thought that O'Mason did the wrong thing, to be honest with you. When you're in there against a guy who's a chess player like that, you don't want to be giving him the time. Don't play chess with him. He wants to play chess with you. Don't go bring out the board and all the chess pieces and say, do you want to be black or white? Which pieces do you want to take? No, you refuse to play chess with him. And instead, you go and do something else. You try and overcome him in another manner. And when you do punch with uh, Dalton Smith, you can have a little bit of success. You can land on him. He can be sometimes a little bit too focused on his offense in moments when you're both exchanging. That's not to say he's not defensively gifted. Like I said, his hands are very, his hand positioning is very good. Uh, he's very good at slipping back, uh, pulling back rather from a wide hook that comes his way because of his distance control. So he's a terrific fighter, there's no doubt about it. But I believe you have to make him work at a tempo that's high and throw punches with him and hope to land in that scenario. Because at this level, he's just looking brilliant. Now it's a very, very stacked uh, light welterweight division here in the UK. You know, you part from him, you've got the likes of uh, Akeem Ennis Brown, you've got Lewis Ritson, you've got Sam Maxwell, you've got Harlem Eubank, Robbie Davis Jr., um, uh, Kaiser Benjamin, Kaizy Benjamin. You've got options there for him if he wants to go down that route of building slowly from this and you know moving up towards commonwealth and european level now um o'hara davis who's operating at i guess you could say a sort of lower world level at the moment it talks about him fighting sandor martin his name was thrown around now he's been in there of course with the likes of josh taylor and uh, tony bellew at the end you could quite clearly see you know the liverpudlians still have a, a real issue with o'hara davis tony bellew did say listen yeah he's a big strong fighter in response to addy but um yeah he's known for being a quitter is what he said so even there he was trying to you know throw some shade at o'hara davis but that's the thing. O'Hara Davis captures the imagination. You've got those that feel he was, as he says, thrown under the bus and they're supportive of him. You've got others that dislike him and just find him to be obnoxious and so on and so forth. That is a personality and that creates interest. So if he was to ever go down the route, I think right now he's a little bit too early, maybe take on somebody a little bit lesser than O'Hara Davis. But if he was to go down that route, 
That would capture the imagination of the British public. The trash talking and so on and so forth. That's the sort of fight that could start to catapult Dalton Smith's name into the consciousness of boxing fans here in the UK a lot more. So he's got options and there's no doubt that they're going to take their time and build him properly. But he's a very, very talented fighter. Let me know what you think about Dalton Smith and where he goes from here. Sam O'Mason as well. What a terrific heart this kid showed. You know, he kept getting up and he would have continued to keep getting up if he was allowed to. Uh, and he's been saying he's willing to take risks and fight absolutely anybody. And, you know, you'd like to see guys like that get another opportunity. So good luck to Sam Mason as well. He gave a good account of himself. And hopefully we see him back in the ring soon. Now, let's talk about the fight I was looking forward to most tonight. And that was Jordan Thompson against Vasil Duka. You know, firstly, a bit of background information on Jordan Thompson. He's six foot six, had a background in tennis, whereby he was a top 10 ranked tennis player by the time he was 16 years old. Now, tennis has a lot of transferable skills when it comes to boxing, even though it's a non-contact sport. You might not think so, but think about some of the skills that you need to have to be a top level tennis player. First and foremost, you have to have very good hand-eye coordination. You have to have very good reflexes with the ability to process information quickly because you're having to react to big serves and return those big serves again kind of like facing a punch and reacting to it slipping it reacting doing something you have to move around the court very quickly with short fast shifts of your feet so you need to have fast and very good footwork again something that translates to boxing these levels of coordination well jordan thompson has been able to make that transition and look very very good and a lot of people are very excited about him he's very tall at six foot six at a cruiserweight quite slim has these long levers and he shoots the jab and the right hand in a laser like fashion and he's got a lovely uppercut too and he's very heavy handed and he's known frank smith who's the number two uh at match room behind eddie hearn for a very long time i believe since they were kids so you know he's going to have the back in there too so you know that this guy's got a lot of talent and there's something there about him and he's got the support He's also had experience sparring some of the best fighters in the world. He's been sparring in the past Alexander Usyk, and he dislikes Usyk to levels that I cannot express. He was recently saying, I hope Anthony Joshua knocks this guy's head clean off. And he repeated it, clean off. Now, he refused to give reasons as to why. If you guys are privy to any information, let us know in the comments down below. But whatever the case might be, he dislikes Usyk, but he's got experience training there. So this is a guy who's taking his career very seriously. But when I heard he was in against Vasil Duka, I knew that this was a real test. And I actually tweeted prior to the fight to say he's in a real test here tonight. Vasil Duka is no joke for a journeyman. Despite his record, he was 11-5 and five going into the fight tonight. He's a tough, durable, and heavy-handed dude that has been in against very good opposition. If Jordan looks good here, I will be very impressed. And make no mistake, this fight did not disappoint. You see, Vasil Duka, you look at that record of 11-5 and five prior to tonight and you think, ah, he's no great shakes, right? He's, you know, who is this dude? But you have to understand, he's been in there with the likes of Mike Perez, who's been to the very upper echelons of the sport. He's been in with Chris Billum smith who's now on the verge of a world title shot. He's been in against Alexei Egorov, who's an undefeated Russian fighter, who's now 11-0. He's been in against Kevin Lorena, who's quite highly rated out of South Africa, who's 27-1 now, who's 21-1 and at the time. So you're talking about a guy who's taken risks and he's been in against big fighters. And, you know, when you're a prospect or you're trying to build your career, it's a lot easier when you have a top level promoter who's manufacturing your path. It's quite easy. I mean, listen, boxing's never easy, but we're talking about relatively, right? It's relatively easier to get to 15 and 0, 16 and 0, 17 and 0. And suddenly people start to take notice when you've been careful about who you've taken on. Well, when you're going to be jumping in against these guys who, compared to your level of experience, are monsters, of course you're going to end up with a record that's 11 and 5. Make no mistake, though, this boy can fight. And I've known about him for a very long time because in only his second fight, he caused an upset. There was a prospect called Nick Parper who uh, had a very attractive style, very muscular guy who would uh, idolize Mike Tyson. He loved Mike Tyson and he would try and come in, look to, to slip side to side, come inside and then unleash these vicious hooks. And I'd spoken to Nick Parper's manager, I knew his manager at the time, and he was telling me that he wasn't 100% happy with Nick's preparation for the fight. And he didn't want him to fight a guy like Dukar because although it was only Dukar's second fight, he had a kickboxing background. So as a fighter, he was a lot more experienced than Nick, who had only fought four professional boxing fights. So it might have looked as a guy who's fought four fights against a guy who's fought one. But in reality, that guy who'd had four fights and who hadn't had ideal preparation and may not have been in the best condition was actually more inexperienced than this other kickboxer 
who was a puncher. And in the only fight he had, he destroyed his opponent inside one round. And he was known for being physically strong and a puncher and uh, could unleash some vicious combinations. And when the fight began, apparently Nick won the first round and then he got caught in the second round and he never recovered. He got knocked out. And it was a shock at the time. But I remember thinking, oh, okay, I'm going to keep an eye on this Vasil Dukar because obviously he's overthrown a prospect, albeit if, you know, I was hearing from the camp that it wasn't an ideal preparation. The fact of the matter is, this is a man to look out for. Well, because of that, I knew that this would be a test because I followed him and I knew this would be hard. And just as I told you, it was hard. Jordan Thompson got off the canvas on the count of nine in the last round. The bell went, the final bell went while he was being counted. If he did not get to his feet, he would have lost the fight. Had he got to his feet, you knew he would have won the fight on points. And this was because he was very good at maintaining range. And by maintaining range and throwing those laser-like straight shots out there and landing some, you know, lovely uppercuts too he was able to get the majority of the work on his side but when Duca would get inside and let go of those vicious combinations without allowing Jordan Thompson to tie him up which he was good at doing at times he was able to have a lot of success and in the end of the ninth round he also hurt Thompson and had there been another I don't know 30 seconds a minute left I would have been worried for Thompson there but the point is here I, Thompson you knew had to be the favorite but Dakar was a live dog even prior to the fight. You knew this is a strong, tough guy and you wouldn't be surprised if he was to get the knockout. Now, this was a 10-round fight. Had it been a 12-round fight, I don't think Jordan Thompson would have made the final bell. He, he literally got up and snubbled back to his corner to win the fight. But here's the thing. This was a great gut check for Jordan Thompson because when you're going in the ring against this sort of uh, opponent who might not look great on paper, but you're doing, you know, you're, you're doing really well for, say, nine rounds overall. You know, there were a couple in there that he had some issues with moments, but clearly you could see that Dakar was, was frustrated at not being able to close the range as, as much as he wanted, throwing his arms up in the center of the ring, t goading him in, come on, let's go. But there were a few moments in there when Dukar would get close and he'd cause some problems. Great learning fight. These are the things you need, those gut checks. And now he's shown that he's got character. And he's going to go back and he's going to look at that. He's going to do some film study. He's going to try and understand, why was I not able to maintain range for 12 rounds? A lot of people, or 10 rounds, a lot of people felt that it wasn't just a question of the gas tank. It was also a, a, a fact that he was complacent. He let him off the hook. He wasn't aggressive enough when he was on top. You see... I get that. I know what you're saying. Put a little bit more offensive output there. Try and bust him up when you're on top. But one of the reasons I think he was able to maintain that range against a guy like Dukai is because he wanted to keep distance. Had he started to put his foot on the gas, he's going to give Dukai those openings to be able to come inside. So he's going to have to find that right balance about how destructive to be versus how cautious to be. How to dictate a tempo, control the tempo. Because even if he was cautious, he clearly did start to feel the tempo of the fight. So he's going to work on gas tank and a variety of other things. There's a lot to work on, a lot. But there's also a lot of talent there that you can see. And he's passed that all-important gut check, which to have that now at this stage of his career, without getting a loss, you know, David Hay had to lose to Thompson in order to then give himself the kick up the backside that he needed to go to new levels. He managed to get a win here tonight against a tough journeyman. And that's a good thing. That's a good tick by Jordan Thompson's name. Moving on from that, let's talk about Campbell Hatton. Hatton has really developed the left hand, the lead hand. His jab's a lot better than it used to be. He's also got uh, the biomechanics to throw double left hooks and a left hook off of the jab. And he does it comfortably. He's very, very good at that. The problem he has is with his right hand. When he's going to throw a right hand, often he'll cock that right hand back. So he'll be in a position where his right hand's up by his face and he'll literally pull it back to throw the right hand. Now, I think a lot of this may have to do with the fact that he's trying to produce too much power with every shot he throws. Rather than just shoot the right hand from there and throw it straight, he's cocking back because he's trying to hurt the guy with every shot he throws. Maybe he's still in that novice mindset of wanting to impress people. The problem with that, potentially, is that because he's quite rangy, I'm not sure he's ever going to be this guy who's going to be a brilliant inside fighter like his father was, or to have the sort of power up close that would enable him to get inside and throw these little short hooks and take guys out. I'm not sure he's got the short power. So I think he loads up because he's trying to produce power that doesn't come naturally to him. Now, one of the problems with that is that if you've got these long levers and he does look rangy for his height, your ideal scenario would be to box at range and keep a guy at range. I don't think he's yet mastered the ability to stay at range. So it's going to take him a very long time to build up towards the level whereby maybe he's stepping up through the levels and going through the levels and being able to dictate fights throughout their course 
when the opposition gets more difficult in other words he's novice. there's an awful lot of work there to do and i'm not a hundred percent sold on him being able to do it unlike somebody like conor ben who's got great athleticism and great power and that unorthodoxy can actually work for him because it means that the opposing fighters can't read the patterns because they're unorthodox and when the trajectory of those patterns land because they're so big he can take your lights out with one big shot campbell hatton doesn't have that and so I'm not, I'm not sure whether he's going to be able to grow exponentially the way that Conor Ben did. Let me know what you think about that. In terms of Sandy Ryan, I didn't see the first fight, so I can't comment too much. Um, but she put in a really good performance, very disciplined. She was able to win the fight quite comfortably on points. As far as I was concerned, she was able to dictate from range. So very good performance from her. Which finally leads us on to Johnny Fisher. Johnny is uh, going to be a very, very popular fighter. And he remains a very popular fighter because he's heavy-handed. He's explosive, as you can see. Uh, he's got you know, a terrific trainer behind him who's a very likable guy as well in Tibbs. And he's got a big fan base behind him. His father's a, a liked guy as well. So you know they're going to be turning out for him and creating an atmosphere. And, you know, he's, I guess you could say there's elements of a Dave Allen type of scenario there where he's becoming a bit of a cult hero. A lot of, you know, sort of regular Joes are really loving him. But there are still elements there for him to work on. I'm sure Tibbs is aware of all these things and he'll continue to work on them. When he's having shots come at him from an unusual angle, particularly those wide looping hooks, he can get hit by them. You know, he, he'll pour the jab out rather than pump it out and then step back out and maintain that range. He's not too focused so, so much on creating that range at always and shots will clip him or catch him. You've got to be very careful in that regard at heavyweight. But he's a heavy-handed guy and he's got some fast hands and you saw him land two clubbing right hands which dropped Reisinger and it looked like Reisinger was done. He flew to the floor. But we saw yet another premature stoppage here in the UK with the referee too keen to wave the fight off immediately after Reisinger hit the floor. You have to understand, he beat the count. He got up and he beat the count. You've got 10 seconds to carry on. And it's not like this was in the second round and he had some success in the first round. So it's not a case of him getting absolutely mullered, battered, and you're thinking, listen, even if he gets up, who cares? He's been hurt so much. Like the O'Mason situation, he'd gotten up too. But he'd received such a shellacking prior to that. You're saving him, right? Well, when it comes to this, the guy was still fresh. Give him to the counter 10. Had Tyson Fury not been given to the counter 10 in the first Wilder fight, we never would have had the trajectory of the sport go down the path that it went. So you need to, to at least take the time to count to 10. Let's see how he's going to react once he's hit the floor. And the biggest problem with this is because you don't... Listen, I expect Fisher would have won this fight regardless. But the problem is that this hurts the development of Fisher too. Because he's up against a guy who's causing one or two issues. Fisher was in control. It's nothing major. But he was getting caught with one or two things. He needs to learn to figure those things out in the ring. Not just land a big shot, get the guy out of there, and then, okay, we forget about it now, we move on. What happens when he's up against a guy who's going to hit, who's not going to go anywhere, and he's got a lot more skill set than Reisinger, but he's spotted what Reisinger did, and he can emulate the areas of success. Well, now, did you learn how to deal with that? No, you weren't given a chance to learn how to deal with it, because the minute your opponent hit the floor, it got waved off. Right? So it harms him as well. That's my take on it. Let me know about all the fights I've spoken about tonight, what your position is. Please don't forget to hit a jab on the like button, a right cross on the notifications button, and an uppercut on the subscribe button. Take care. God bless.